Good morning, Kids Church. How are you? I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying this lovely weather over the last few days. Have you? I've seen some pictures of some of you in paddling pools and eating ice cream. It's been great, hasn't it? And it's so lovely to be back with you, learning about Jesus and singing, singing about him, isn't it? Now, in the week, I asked you two questions. I wonder if you can remember what they were. If not, here's a little hint. One, have you ever told a lie? Now, I think if we were going to be really, really honest, we could probably say we have. And I think probably a lot of grown-ups have too. The other thing is, why did you tell that lie? Was it to get you out of trouble? Maybe you did something you didn't want anyone to know. Was it to make yourself feel better? Was it to make you look better than everybody else? I don't know, there's lots of reasons to tell lies, aren't there? Well, in today's story, we're going to learn about people who told a lie and we're going to learn about what happened to them and what that means for us today. Now, before we do that, we've got some songs we're going to sing. Now, I want to say a big, big thank you for everyone who sent me a video. because There's a little something that's going to happen now. We're going to sing a song and you might spot some of you dancing, singing, doing the actions. So thank you for doing that. So I want you to stand up. I want you to sing nice and loud, do those actions so that your neighbours can hear, so they can hear you singing about Jesus and all the good things he's done. Are you ready? Here we go. Every word of your word is true, they were all breathed out by you. Your spirit wrote through men like a pen in the hand of a God who knew that we would need to know. For us forever Oh, oh, oh From Genesis to Revelation There's one story of your great salvation It's all about Jesus Oh, it's all about Jesus Shout now from every page There's one hero that'll save the day It's all about Jesus Oh, it's all about Shines so bright, he leads us day by day to the one, the way, the truth, the light. And every time we read, you give us what we need to grow in grace and know you better. Oh, oh, oh. from Genesis to Revelation, it's one story of your great salvation. It's all about Jesus. Oh, it's all about Jesus. Even from Eden we read, the serpent will be crushed by a seed of Eve Cause all glory belongs to the sun, every story pointing to the Holy One Light, when Abraham put Isaac on the altar He pulled a knife, but God, he never falters Faithful to his promise, he would provide a substitute ram for the sacrifice And now, he gave commandments so we could see His holiness and our desperate need there were so many temporary sacrifices None of them were perfect, no, but Christ is The prophets spoke and they were not liars God was in his very own son to be Messiah Rescue, redeem, restore, reclaim Every saint loves his holy name Cause he died on the cross to take our place The final substitute and eternal grace And he rose from the grave and up to the throne Until he comes again to gather his own From Genesis to Revelation this one story of your great salvation It's all about Jesus, so oh, It's all about Jesus Shout now from every page This one hero that'll save the day It's all about Jesus, so oh, It's all about Jesus
seek the Lord like no good thing. The lions may grow weak and hungry. The lions may grow weak and hungry. Yeah, yeah. The lions may grow weak and hungry. But those who seek the Lord like no good thing. was amazing. Ezra and Evie were certainly singing out loud and doing the actions. That's some of their favourite songs. I hope you were singing nice and loud too. Well, like I said, we're going to be learning um, about some people who told a lie. Now, we learned a story last week from Acts and this story is a bit later on in Acts, in Acts chapter 5 and I'm just going to tell it in my own words. Um, but that's where it was if you want to look for it later. Now, in those days, it was the start of the church, the really, really early church. And there were lots and lots of people starting to come to know Jesus. And they were being baptised, a bit like some of your parents have been, or even um, some of your friends. And we see that, don't we? And it's such an amazing thing. And that's what was happening here in this church. And we, we were learning about, um, a few weeks ago, weren't we? We were learning about how um, Jen had these little circles and some of those things that those, those early Christians were doing. And one of those things we learned about today, they were, they were selling things they owned and then they were given to people who needed it, to people who didn't maybe have something and they needed some food or somewhere to stay. And, and they were able to help them in that way. And a man called Joseph did that. He sold a field that he had and he gave all his money from, that, from the sale of that field. He gave it to the apostles and they were able to help people who needed some food and other things. Now, there were another um, couple, a man and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, they saw what Joseph did and they thought, ah, oh, I'm going to do that too. But what they did is they sold some property that they had. But instead of giving all of the money that they got from it, they wanted to keep some from themselves. Now, no one said they had to give, give the money away. That was something they wanted to do. But... They wanted to make themselves look a bit better than they maybe actually were. So what they did is they sold their field and they gave the money to Peter. And Peter said, is this the money from your field? He said, yes, this is all the money. When really they'd kept some back home. And Ananias went and did this. And then, but Peter knew that they weren't telling the truth. The Holy Spirit had helped him know that they weren't telling the truth. And actually... He hadn't given all their money. And what happened to him? He actually died right there. Now, three, three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, didn't know what happened to her husband, came and she said, here's the money from the sale of our property. And again, they said, oh, is this all the money? Yes, this is all the money. But was she telling the truth? No, she wasn't telling the truth. She'd kept some. And the same thing happened to her. She died. She was buried with her husband, Ananias. And this news got round to all the early Christians and it was a real warning to them about how telling lies is not a good thing and that God always finds out about that. Now, it's a bit of a sad story really, isn't it? But it shows us the importance of sinning and doing stuff that's against God. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that because... If we tell a lie now, we don't die straight away, just like Ananias and Sapphira did, do we? No, We're gonna, I'm gonna show you something in a little while to help you um, understand that a bit better. 
But first, let's see how well you were listening. I'm going to hold up some questions, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to see if you know the answers. So here we go. Question number one. Why did the believers give away everything they owned? Tell someone, tell someone in your, in your living room right now, why do you think the believers gave away everything they owned? That's it, they were following Jesus' example. He gave everything up for us, didn't he? He gave up his life for us and they were trying to follow that example. Giving away things and helping other people. Okay, question two. How did Peter know that Ananias, Ananias, sorry, I've got it wrong now, and Sapphira were lying? Tell someone. The Holy Spirit told them, didn't they? God showed them, the Holy Spirit showed them that he was lying. That's right. Next question. Did Ananias and Sapphira have to sell their property? No, they didn't have to, did they? They didn't have to do it at all. They chose to do it. That's what it says in verse four of chapter five, that that was their choice to do it. Next one. What should Ananias and Sapphira have done? What should they have done? They should have been honest, shouldn't they? They could have said, here's here's some some of the money to help other people. They didn't have to say it was all of the money, did they? They should have been honest and that's the best thing, isn't it? That's what we should be, always be honest. Last one. What did they actually do? Instead of being honest, what what did they actually do? That's right, they told a lie, didn't they? They told a lie to the apostles, but also to the Holy Spirit. And that's not great, is it? That's what we call sin. I'm going to show you something now that will hopefully explain this story a bit more and what it means for us. And I'm going to use two balloons. I've got two balloons here, and these are the people. Now these people, these balloons, are full of air. They're people, they're full of sin. We all mess up, we all do things wrong, don't we? We've talked about lying today, but there's other stuff we might do that um, we call sin. When we disobey our mummy and daddies, when we say unkind things, when we do unkind things. Now, there's a difference between these. This one is just a normal balloon. This one has got some water in it. Okay, and I'm going to explain more about that one in a minute. Now, like I said, this balloon represents a person. They're full of sin. I'm going to use a candle here to help me. And this candle is going to represent God's judgment. Now, we've thought of a verse, Romans, in Romans, it says, for the wages of sin is death. So let's see what happens when I put this balloon over here. Now, I'm going to show you what happens to the other balloon. just need to light my candle again first to show you this. Okay. Here we go. Now, this balloon, we said, it's still full of sin. But this balloon, it's got water in it, and that water represents Jesus. Someone who loves and trusts Jesus. Now, they still mess up. They still maybe tell lies or do things wrong but they ask Jesus to forgive them. Let's see what happens to this balloon now. Wow. It says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of life is eternal life. Now, isn't that amazing? The gift of Jesus is eternal life. And we can have that if we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, if we can say sorry, if we repent for the bad, wrong things we've done. And he will forgive us. He came to this earth, didn't he, as a baby, and he died on the cross so he could take our sin. That's grace. He's shown us so much grace there. Something we deserve. We deserve death. But yet Jesus came into this world to save us. And so I want you to remember that little illustration. Hopefully will help you with this story. Now I'm going to pray now um, before we get on with the rest of our service. 
dear Jesus, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you died and you rose again um, and you took all that punishment on you so that we don't have to. I just say sorry now for all the wrong things that I've done um, and just pray that you'll forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's just about it for Kids Church. Just one last thing, you sh your parents should be able to print off a little um, colouring sheet like this. And it says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and us and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's a little memory verse for us to remember. So you can colour that in when Josh is talking to the grown-ups. Well, it's great to um, be with you again and I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Bye. Well, good morning and welcome to our online gathering. We're going to be starting in 15 minutes time. So that gives you enough time to go and grab a cup of coffee uh, or go and grab a cup of tea. It also gives you enough time to go and invite your friends and family to come and join us this morning as we worship King Jesus. We'd love you to do that. So go and invite your friends and family. Also say hi in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you've been doing uh, this weekend. Tell us maybe you've done something for VE Day uh, and what you've been up to. And we'll see you in 15 15 minutes time.
Well, good morning and welcome to our online gathering. It's a real honour and joy that you are able to join us this morning. I want to welcome those coming from Cornerstone Church Wirral and those from Rooted Church South Wirral also. My name's Dave, I'm one of the leaders at Rooted Church. You may be joining us from further afield and it's a real joy and honour and privilege that you can join us this morning. Uh, maybe you're coming from other churches or other locations around the UK. Maybe you're joining us this morning and you're new to church and you're new to Christianity. You want to find out a little bit more. And we are really excited that you are able to join us this morning. And we are delighted that we get to share a little bit more about Jesus with you. Um, throughout the service, you can take part in the chat. We'd love to hear what you've been up to this week. Um, I wonder what you did on Friday. Uh, maybe you uh, joined in with the 75th anniversary of VE Day. Uh, what you did to celebrate that. Uh, please share with us. We as a family, we went out on the front, uh, front, our front garden and we took a picnic out there and we celebrated and it was great to see neighbours from a distance uh, as we enjoyed, uh, as we enjoyed scones and um, jam and all that kind of stuff um, and uh, had a really great time. Share with us, tell us what you did, uh, maybe post online some of the pictures of your celebrations uh, and what you did on Friday. Throughout the service, there is an option to be prayed for and to ask more questions. You can click on the live prayer button um, and one of our leaders would love to pray with you and you can ask any of your questions that you might have there also. In a moment, we're going to spend some time worshipping and praising King Jesus together. So I want to encourage you, continue to take your pictures at home. We love to see you guys worshipping at home when we can't be with you physically. Turn your TVs up, turn your computers up and your tablets up and sing along as we sing and praise Jesus. Before we do that, I'm going to pray for us. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that you are our almighty God. God that is the creator and sustainer of everything. We thank you that we get to worship you as the king of this world as the ruler of our lives. We thank you that we have the privilege of doing this. We thank you that even though we can't physically gather, we can still worship you in our homes. And we just pray that this, this morning you would help us to lift our eyes and to see you for who you truly are. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's so great to gather this morning, isn't it? Um, and I can't wait to um, sing worship songs together with you from across the Wirral and further afield if you're joining us from the rest of the UK. Um, why don't you grab an instrument yourself or open up your windows, um, your, your doors out of your house um, and let your neighbours hear you praising God this morning. Um, just to help focus this and encourage our souls this morning, I'm just going to read um, from Psalm 62, starting at verse 6. It says, he only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Isn't that just so encouraging, reading those words, um, reading God's words this morning um, in, his, in his holy book, knowing that even in the deepest and darkest of weeks that we can come knowing that our comfort is found in our heavenly father he is our father that we can trust that we can know deeply um and he loves us so much um he has um he has given us a way out of our sinfulness. He has given us hope with um, which we can hold um, in our hearts every day um, that we face difficult things and every day when we face great things, we can know that we have hope in Jesus. Um, so let's do what it says here. Let's pour our hearts out this morning in adoration and in praise to our holy God, um, to our Lord Jesus Christ and his spirit who lives in us. Um, and let's sing together now. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation.
father You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am
Hi, I'm Avril and um, over the next few weeks we're going to be talking to uh, some of our gospel community leaders um, and we're going to hear about how God has been working in and through them um, in the middle of all um, this chaos and lockdown. Um, this week we're going to start with uh, Lee and Jen who run um, the, G the New Ferry Gospel Community um, and we're just going to, to chat to them. So welcome Lee and Jen. Ah. Hi, how are you doing? How, how are you and your family doing um, through all this? Um, yeah, we're good, thanks. We're um, just getting into, in, into a, a bit of a routine. Um, obviously, it's been a six or seven weeks now. Um, so I'm still working as normal, really. And Jen's obviously homeschooling the kids and, and running after... Oh, no. Well, yeah, only Eleanor. And then obviously <laughs> running after Hannah and... <laughs> changing Lottie's nappies all day but yeah but yeah we're all doing well all doing well yeah oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, can you share with us um sort of evidences of God's grace over the last few weeks and um, that would be good for yeah yeah so it's been actually really encouraging in GC like it's obviously a bit different and um, we're not seeing each other and that's hard but um there's people being like really creative and like how they're keeping in touch with each other and um, Jenny um, in RGC, she made like a lovely video for um, the girls because we normally would go to her house and Hannah would play. She's got like a lovely little cupboard that she lets Hannah go and get toys from. So she made like a little video of going into that cupboard, getting a toy out and playing with them. And they just loved that. So that was like a huge blessing to us. Um, and yeah. yeah, just like we've had lots of people like delivering little things to our doorstep and everyone's been doing that for each other really. And just, um, yeah, just how people are talking on the WhatsApp group as well. Like that seems to have got um, maybe more like um, just everyone getting involved and a bit more personal and um, yeah, just really like a sense of like coming together through it all. I think. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, can you share as well with us? Um, I'm sure you've had some challenges as well over the last few weeks. Can you share just some of your maybe main challenges that you've uh, you found? Yeah, I think it's it's just it's it's just been a difficult time, hasn't it? It's like none of us are, are used to this. Everyone sort of was trying to work out what lockdown looks like. What did it look like to um what did it look like to to do church when we can't physically see each other? So mm -hmm. there's challenge itself in that. You know, we've got situations within like with our GC work, um, you know, people working still or, or people living alone. So actually, you know, challenges how do we love and care for one another? Um, in the midst of of all sorts of different circumstances, in the midst of what's going on with COVID nineteen, and and also there's like it is quite easy to disconnect at times, and the challenge is not to. So it's quite easy to you know be be in your house and and maybe maybe not engaging. So it's really like um, I wouldn't say it's challenging, but it's more of a you know people need to like. You know, have to make more effort to make sure you are in touch with each other regularly. Make sure you are on the phone to each other. You know, so it's, it, that's a little bit more difficult. And and also Sundays as well. It's like Sundays have been such a blessing, and it's amazing to to be able to sort of gather together online with like you know the the guys you've reported together have done an amazing job. The worship team's done a fantastic job, and Josh has been a great. Um, done a great job leading us through the services and through God's word and but there's just something about not gathering together and 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 there's a challenge of how do you go from like a a, a Sunday gathering to sort of after the zoom call after uh, uh, with, with the GC after to then it sort of stops when we'd normally have people over or we'd go to other people's houses or we'd um or we go for walks so just do something you know, together, it's like actually how, you know, there's, there's a gap there, which we, we really do miss. So it's, um, I think as well, like we just started all that, like intentionality stuff, haven't we? So we just started that like real focus on being missional and inviting like all our friends with our GC things. And I think, um, yeah, just that um, challenge to keep that going, to keep inviting people, even mm. if it's like our Zoom quiz or whatever it looks like, it'll just look a bit different. But actually, like the opportunities are there now more than ever in a way, aren't they? To invite people to the service, invite people to um, like our social stuff. It's just it just looks a bit different, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you feel as well that God has been teaching your GC 
through uh, through this time as well and through the challenges. Yes, I think there's more of a a dependency on God. I think this is um, this is taken away a lot in terms of freedom of being able to go out or 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 keep yourself busy with other things. But I think it's just I think with with this one to learning and as Jen like referred to earlier, it's been so encouraging how as the weeks have gone on, the conversations have got a lot more in depth about God. We are we're seeing people ask some some amazing questions and it's not just amazing because of where they are. It's actually challenging the whole GC to think about their their theology and their stance and their own doctrine and things like that. So that's been a that's been um yeah that's been a real blessing to walk through that as well. And I think there's that 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 the, the importance of gospel relationships in the midst of this. I think that's um what God's been teaching us. And it is like um a a sadness when we can't see face to face. But um you know when we when we are feeling when we're finding things a little bit more difficult um you know it's, it's great to see people turning to each other it's great to hear people um praying for each other people asking for prayer requests people asking for prayer requests for their neighbors and their and their friends so that's been like a, a real encouraging time and, and quite a difficult time you know i so, think because yeah. there's like so much going on as well in different situations so with like neighbors or friends like I guess like conversations are naturally a bit deeper now and, and they go that way a bit quicker than so it's like pastoral or superficial a bit quicker which which is great isn't it so I think um yeah as a GC we're just learning how to respond in that and um and to each other as well you know like we have in GC now we have like question time don't we where um people just ask like questions there's no um yeah it's just a good sense of people aren't afraid to ask silly things yeah. and nothing silly like it's it's okay to ask those things so yeah. i think that's definitely made us closer hasn't it and just more open with each other and yeah that's been good hasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> that's really encouraging to hear you um, you were talking as well about um that you've had some quizzes and things and um, how are you keeping connected with one another and with friends and um, what other things have you been doing to sort of um you know to open those opportunities yeah so that's been great like we've had like games night like, every friday and um, so different people have led those like that's another encouragement that it's not just like us as gc leaders who can do that like everyone in our in our gcs can take a lead with that it's something quite simple to do like we've done we've done bingo um that lee led with a very old-fashioned yeah. bingo it's always a fan's favorite everyone loves a bit of bingo yeah um vinnie um, led a great quiz for us um and then liz and pete they did, they did um, a pointless quiz for us, um, which was a bit more high tech, wasn't it? That was more impressive. Um, but yeah, everyone's like had to go, and like people have been invited, family, um, like Tina, Katie, um, they've invited people, and um, we've invited some neighbours, some non-Christian friends. So that's been really good, just to um, yeah, just to have a laugh, and and also a distraction, I think, from just the seriousness of the situation, but just just that um, good like sense of community together as well and, and involving all different people so it's nice that people are joined and felt comfortable yeah. isn't it and yeah yeah it's been it's been great as well like from a you know it's, it's opened up a load more opportunity with our neighbors like i say we're, we're really blessed with having yeah. neighbors like they brought like, things over for the kids and it's actually you know it's actually allowed for other conversations to take place with the neighbors so it's more like you know just um yeah just just making the most of that yeah. really and just you know so in 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 a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a, even the sad time it's actually an answer to prayer that actually we're building very strong relationships through this than we had before yeah so again that's god god's grace throughout that as well so yeah sounds great yeah and if i'm oh, sorry i was just going to say the whatsapp group with the school mums has been really good as well because obviously people are like really worried like panicking but just being able to like say oh we're doing this on a sunday morning even just that simple thing so they might not log in or join in but just that like that they know what we're doing and like that we're praying for them and um and somehow like in a wise way just sharing that we have that peace like so we are like you know it's not good as well and we the, there's that natural worry and natural fear but the fact that we can turn to god in it and we have him to turn to has been really um yeah just being able to share that's been an opportunity that we wouldn't have had before i think so yeah and with that as well like we, we've seen on sundays where a, load of, um, a lot of people like 
non-believers that have, have watched the sermons. Mm-hmm. You know, people have logged on to watch the kids, like the great kids stuff at the beginning of the sermon. And, mm-hmm. and for it, so even like my mum down south has been, been watching, I've watched a few mm-hmm. of them now and that as well. So things like that, she would have done, you know, being like 200 miles away. So yeah, yeah that's great. So Yeah. That's really great, Jeff. Sounds like you're having a lot of fun as well. <laughs> yeah, um, and finally, uh, what can we be praying for you and for um, for your GC yeah. at the moment, especially? Yeah, I think it's the, I think it's, you said many times throughout the church, but it's, it's like we use this time wisely to get to know God better. I think that, uh, that, that, that's a biggie. Um, you know, we need to, we believe that God's over and above all the situations and, you know, he's given us this time in whatever context we may be to to be with him and you know so um yeah just pray for that and uh, just pray for situations as well we've got you know obviously a lot of our families and friends are affected by this like for illness so just pray for strength and our and our dependence on god as we as we walk through this um i say pray for those continued relationships that grow in the gc but also with those um who's 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 not believers like i say we we've been praying for a lot of people for a long time and um yeah just keep just praying for us as we seek to to reach those who are lost yeah. and i guess like going forward just that those relationships with our neighbors and those people who we've engaged perhaps more with than we had before that that carries on that this isn't just like a phase that um and then it goes back to like um becoming a bit more into again but with all our gc people really that 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 carries on with everyone else so um yeah that that's not just lost when it goes back to a bit more normality maybe that there's fruit from that and god keeps growing all that he's done yeah yeah that's great joe yeah. thanks for um sharing all that with us generally and yeah we um we'll all be praying for you yeah thank you uh, thanks everyone hi i'm tina and I'm part of the New Fellow GC so today I'm just going to read um, a passage from Matthew 5 and just pray before we come to hear God's word with Josh okay so Christ came to fulfill the law do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them but truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away not an iota not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Yeah, pray, Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a good Father. You're a Father of love and grace and mercy. And thank you that you sent Jesus Christ, your Son, to fulfill the law and the prophets and give that ultimate sacrifice so that now we are redeemed, we have a new identity and secure in Christ. We pray as we come to hear your word today through Josh, that, um, that we come humbly to you, Father, We pray that you reveal yourself to us, maybe in ways that we've never experienced before. And I pray that through your Holy Spirit that you convict us, challenge, but also comfort and reassure us that we can be transformed through through your Holy Spirit to be more like Jesus. So I pray as we gather as a church and that um, we're not meeting in person, but we're still connecting through technology. And we thank you for that, Lord. And just pray for those reminders that um, although we can't meet in person and we're longing to see each other, that we are united in Christ. We are one body through the Holy Spirit. And thank you for that, Lord. So we pray these things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Well, good morning. And we're so delighted and honoured that you've joined us. And I'm really excited to take us through the next bit of the Sermon on the Mount series that we began a few weeks ago. So I'd love you to keep that Bible open at the passage that Tina has read for us. It's been so encouraging to hear uh, news of how God's Word is speaking to you. It's been great to hear some of those challenges and, and what you're wrestling with in your gospel communities. The Sermon on the Mount is a very well-known passage of Scripture, but can often be a misunderstood one. So it's encouraging to hear how God is reforming us and shaping us. If you remember those free challenges, those free invitations we set out in week one about uh, that we would learn a new way in Jesus and find life that we would turn to him, that we would follow him. And in so doing, we would find life. And, and when we do those things, we need to be reorientated around Jesus. And the Sermon on the Mount isn't necessarily about how we become Christians. It's more about how we live as Christians in the kingdom of heaven. And the audience that is listening to Jesus, the crowds that are assembled listening to Jesus on the Mount, as they heard this teaching, just like we are, it felt revolutionary. It seemed new. It seemed different. It had a different quality and kind to it. And remember at the end of the sermon in chapter 7, they were astonished with his teaching. They were astonished with his authority by which he taught them. Because it was like what they had heard was new and different, but same and as of the old because what Jesus is doing is revealing his intent in the mission he has come to accomplish and he's teaching them the way of the kingdom and the wrestle for the listening crowds was how do they reconcile what they are hearing with what they had already known you'll see in verse 17 Jesus references the law and the prophets that he hasn't come to abolish them because what they were hearing was something they already knew but they were wrestling with what Jesus was saying because they were wondering is Jesus upholding what we already know therefore continuing it or is it something different altogether and if so does that mean we disregard the whole old testament that's what the phrase law and prophets mean it's just simply another way of saying the whole old testament and to the religious pharisees and scribes this was their wrestle that they were the religious conservatives of the day they had a high view of scripture and a high view of god's word in fact they memorized it and they hated Jesus because it felt like to them that Jesus was doing something different from what God had done before. But on the flip side in the crowd, you had those who, who looked at the religious conservatives of the day and, and felt that we're not good enough. We cannot attain what they have done. We cannot be like them. We can't be good enough for God, surely, if that's what it means to be accepted by God. But they were the ones that flocked to Jesus, not away from Jesus. They flocked to Jesus because finally they heard good news in God's word. They heard good news that they could be accepted by God despite the fact that their lives didn't measure up to the religious elites of the day. So, so what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount? Is Jesus lessening the demands of the law in Old Testament? Is he lowering the bar of entry into the kingdom? Is he making it easier and more acceptable? Or is he upholding what the Pharisees and the scribes were saying? You see, these are two schools of thinking that are reflective in the church today. You know, I've often heard it said that, well, the God of the Old Testament seems mad and angry all the time, but the God of the New Testament seems loving, kind and gracious. You know, I like him a bit more than I do the God of the Old Testament. I can relate more with Jesus than I can with a God who has judgment and wrath in him. Have you said it? Have you thought it? Do you secretly want to get rid of the Old Testament? You see, what we can end up doing is similar to the scribes and the Pharisees. We can end up comparing and contrasting the Old Testament and the New Testament and thereby dividing up the Bible itself and separating it and essentially cutting some out and disregarding some. So what must we do? Perhaps you think that would be a good idea because that would make it easier for you to share the gospel with your friends and family. Hey, it might even be a strategy to get more people into church. Well, today we find out what Jesus thinks about such remarks and such thinking. We actually come to see Jesus' conviction and view of the Old Testament, which is essentially his word because he's God and he spoke it. Look at verse 7 again. He says, I have not come to abolish it. Look at verse 18. None of it is going to pass away. Look at verse 19, that there are consequences for those who relax it and teach it like that to others, 
but there are rewards and, uh, to those who uphold it. There's a promise to those who teach it. Like pretty unanimously, Jesus reveals to us that his position in the Old Testament isn't that it's going to be thrown away, it's going to be undone, it's going to be disregarded, we should just cut it up and start again and forget about it. No, he upholds it, says he fulfills it, says that it will not go away until all is accomplished. So what does that mean for us? Well, it's summed up in verse 20. It says in verse 20, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And that's my first point. We need a greater righteousness to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is where Jesus teaches culminates. He's not come to abolish the old, but rather he upholds it and says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's shocking, isn't it? To enter the kingdom of heaven, I need to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. Why? Because God knows and cares about your heart and your actions. Righteousness simply is who God is. That is his perfect holiness. And therefore, because that is who he is, to be in his presence, to be in his kingdom, we need to have a perfect righteousness also because sin and brokenness cannot be in his presence because he's perfect and holy and right. And because God knows and cares about your heart, the righteousness must exceed the Pharisees and the scribes to be able to enter that kingdom. Well, here were the Pharisees and the scribes. As I said, they were the religious elites of the day. They were the conservatives of the day. In fact, Pharisee meant separated one. There was a distinction between them and everyone else. They were the good guys who loved the scriptures, who held up the scriptures, who viewed them as the authoritative word of God. They even memorized the whole Old Testament and taught other people to do the same. Their actions, their tithes, their offerings exceeded that of everybody else. They tried to obey every part of God's word. And you know what? Most of them did a pretty good job of it. They even set up other laws around those laws to make sure they didn't even come close to infringing the word of God. And you know what? I can kind of resonate a bit with that. I grew up in a, in a home that attended church, was part of a church uh, fa- family and life. And, and I had a misunderstanding of how the Old Testament and New Testament held together. You know, I would hear laws such as, you should not get drunk. So in my, in my environment growing up, I thought that meant, well, I can't go near beer or alcohol. In fact, I would set up another law around that where I wouldn't even go to a drink, even a non-alcoholic one that had the word beer in it. So there was no root beer for me. And I still don't like it to this day. And I wonder if that's just me consciously uh, trying not to break the word of God, the law of God. There was even, uh, well, I know I shouldn't smoke. But just to protect myself from that, I'm not even going to put a fake cigarette in my mouth in case somebody would see me and think that I'm smoking and therefore breaking the word of God. You know, I, I know I shouldn't have sex outside of marriage, you know, but just in case, I'm not even going to talk to a girl or be seen with a girl. In fact, I might be tempted and break the law of God. That was a bit like how the Pharisees functioned. But you see, this isn't the shocking thing. The shocking thing about our righteousness that should exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes comes after the passage that we've had read for us. What's shocking is that the righteousness that should exceed the Pharisees should look like the six examples that come after verse 20 and verse 21 to 48. You see, Jesus gives these examples about what it means to exceed their righteousness. And he uses this repeated pattern in each one. He begins each of them saying, you have heard it said of those of old, a phrase, uh, which is related to God's word, but not the exact word of God in his law. And then he comes to exceed that by teaching what that law really meant. Look at verse 21 and you'll see that played out. He says, you have heard it, you've heard that it was said of, to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. You see what's happened there? This isn't the words that God spoke in the law. This is what the Pharisees and the scribes said. They took the first part, you shall not murder. They then added their own part, which was, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. They added to it. They set up these guards and fences, perimeters around it to protect themselves. But Jesus says, verse 22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
See, Jesus comes and he says, your righteousness needs, needs to exceed the Pharisees and the scribes, and this is what I mean. Not only should you not murder, but you shouldn't even be angry. Verse 27 is verse 28. You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, even anyone who has got lust in their heart has sinned. Verse 31, verse 32, he upholds marriage in God's design, but do not separate for any reason outside of those what God says. Verse 33 to 35, don't use oaths to manipulate God or others, rather let your yes be yes. Verse 38, 39, he says, you think it's okay to retaliate? An eye for an eye? No, I tell you that when you get struck on the cheek, you should turn the other cheek and not retaliate. Verse 43 to 48, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies even. Jesus seems to take the, the Old Testament law and he seems to add another level or dimension to it that as we read that we go, oh my goodness. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna murder somebody, but yeah, I've got anger in my heart. Yeah, I'm not gonna commit adultery, but yeah, I, I've got lust in my heart and I have lust in my eyes and my desires. What Jesus is unpacking is what this greater righteousness looks like. And it concludes in verse 48 with this verse. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Whoa. You know, I I thought I understood this righteousness. I thought I understood what Jesus was saying. And Jesus just comes in and seems to smash what I thought. And seems to raise the bar even more to perfection. Perfection? I can't do perfection. What Jesus means in that word perfect is complete and whole. He's saying that not just must your outer external works be good and right and in line with God's law, but your internal heart and motivations must line up with them. In fact, it's from your internal heart motivations that your external works reflect who you are and what you believe. Can any of us say that we're capable of that type of righteousness or obedience? We need a greater righteousness And in response to that, we always will fall into two categories or two options in response to that. Either you will try harder to obtain a greater righteousness by your own works or simply you will receive a righteousness. So secondly, my second point, we need a greater righteousness, not greater ways to dodge the challenge that Jesus lays out. And Jesus reveals that there are three ways we try to obtain this greater righteousness in our own works or ways in which we try to dodge what he is saying. The first one is verse 19 is that we essentially will relax the demands of Jesus to make it easier to obtain them and obey them. Jesus challenges those who do this. Firstly, the Pharisees and the scribes, he says, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus challenges the Pharisees and the scribes who who were the kind of religious elite, as I said. They determined not to break any of God's law they had. And they devised this intricate system, like I said, those fences and perimeters to ensure that they wouldn't break the law. But not just that, they relaxed the laws by making them easier to obey. They thought God's word demanded perfection and failure resulted in punishment. So they changed and viewed God's word not as a relational revealing of God to his people, but rather as demands and a law code to obey. They also looked upon what God said and they neglected to know that God cares about the heart. Though man looks on the outside, God is concerned with the heart. They separated the intention of God's word to merely demands and law as opposed to God who's concerned about the whole person and relationship with him. They relaxed the laws by emphasizing some over others, thereby teaching that there were some more important parts of God's word than the rest. And thereby doing that, they divided up God's word and chose what they thought God would consider more important, thereby lessening God's word completely. And, and by doing it, they obscured the truth and the integrity, the meaning and the purpose of God's word completely. Are we guilty of this? What do you do with the hard parts of God's word? The parts that contradict you, that contradict our culture, our feelings, our desires, the lust and demands, uh, the parts that are hard and that push back on your thinking. Do you merely assent to the things that we understand or, uh, or the things that we like? You see, that's not following Jesus. That's merely creating a God who agrees with you and with what you want. 
You see the holiness of God on display through all of his word, his law, his commands. All of it is designed to expose our sin and to expose that the human desire is always to seek to appease our guilt and our conscience and to minimize and downplay the wrath and the holiness of God. So we change, we justify, we make allowances to appease culture, family, friends, and we end up changing and playing with scripture in a way to make it more palatable to our friends and easier for us to obey. There is a right and wrong way to view scripture, and Jesus says it here, that there is consequences to those who change it and relax it, but there is a reward and a promise to those who who adhere to it in conformity in their actions, Uh, but also he teaches it to others in the way that he intended it. So Jesus coming now in this Sermon on the Mount is is explaining his true meaning and exposing in the midst of that some uncomfortable truths for us, but he rightly expounds it and rightly restores its integrity. So to our relaxing, to our upholding some parts of God's word and not others, to our striving by our performance, Jesus says, stop it. Don't relax it one bit. Don't just teach one bit, but all of it and feel the weight of the holiness of God and his righteousness and your lack of it. Why? Because God knows and cares for your heart. The second thing we'll try to do is to deny the authority of God's word over our life. Jesus shows us in how he views, handles and understands his word that is not passing away in verse 18. He says it's permanent, it's perfect, it's enduring. He's saying that not even an iota, which was like the smallest letter, which looks like our apostrophe or not even a dot, a dot above a letter which would distinguish Uh, letters from others none of it will pass away in fact later on in chapter 24 of Matthew he will speak to the Pharisees and scribes and say that his word will never pass away you see the Old Testament God is Jesus and Jesus is the Old Testament God uh, and he is the same Jesus speaking these words in fact after his resurrection in Luke 24 Jesus opened up the scriptures beginning with the law and prophets and showed how it was all about himself You see, you cannot separate Jesus from Scripture. And when you say that Scripture isn't consistent with your Jesus, you cease to follow Jesus. And you make yourself a judge over God. You put yourself in authority over God. And in fact, Jesus taught all parts of the Old Testament. And in fact, in his teachings, he would often refer to the parts that we find hardest to believe ourselves and our culture today. He would talk about Adam and Eve. He would talk about Noah and the flood. He would talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. He would talk about Jonah and the large fish. You see, we say things like, well, that was the Old Testament. We don't need that. You know, give me Jesus and everything after. And in the midst of that, we diminish and minimize the authority of the complete revealed word of God to us. And what we essentially do is just divide it and separate it. But that's doing something that Jesus doesn't give us permission to do. Verse 18 is very clear that not one bit of it will pass away until it is all accomplished. Tim Keller I quote now brilliantly says, are you sifting through the Bible, deciding what you like and what you don't like? Or are you letting it sift through you, deciding what it doesn't like and what it does like? Which is it? Either it's an authority over you or you are an authority over it. If there's anything you dislike about it, it means you've put yourself in a position to judge any verse. Oh, do you feel a sting of that? I think he's really pressing into what Jesus is saying here. Why, why is there such an uncomfortability with what the Old Testament says to us and in fact all of Scripture? It's because we want to disregard it and do away with it and be in authority ourselves. But Jesus doesn't allow us to do that. The Old Testament and the law in particular was not just preparing the way for the Messiah to come. It was instructing us in the righteous demands of God and through it we see his holiness and we see how, fall we sh- we, how, fall, how short we fall. Sorry. Uh, and how desperate our need is. So you need to come back and consider, are you doing what Jesus warns against? J.I. Packer puts it another way. He says, the fact we have to face is that Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, claims divine authority for all that he did and taught, both confirmed the absolute authority of the Old Testament for others and submitted to it unreservedly himself. Clearly then the question is this, what think ye of The Bible reduces to the question, what think you of Jesus? To deny the authority of Scripture is to deny the authority of the person of Jesus. 
We need to feel the tension and weight of our sin. The greater you see your sin and your need of a saviour, the greater in your heart, mind and eyes will the all-sufficient saving work of Jesus be to you. He not only meets your need, but he satisfies you completely in your past, present and future. To our challenging the authority of the scriptures over us, Jesus says it is, it is the authority over us. It is his very words and it's not going anywhere because God knows and cares about your heart. The third thing we do in verse 17 is that we want to do away with it all together. But Jesus saying, don't think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Clearly there were some who think that was the case. Clearly there was a misunderstanding about the relationship between the Old Testament and Jesus. And there can be even so today. But that is set clear once you see what Jesus says in these verses. This isn't a truth for us to feel whether it's right. It's a truth to agree to and submit to. You see, the role of the law, the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament was to reveal God to us and reveal who we are. You see, man was not created as a free, autonomous individual as much as culture wants you to believe you are. We were not created to be a law to ourselves, but bound to keep the law of our maker. But this was no hardship for us because as we were created for God and by God, in grateful obedience to him, it would lead to our greatest joy and delight and satisfaction. But sadly, because of sin, it distorts and twists our hearts and our minds to the fact now where we hate God and his word. You see, the purpose of God's word and his law was to indicate what true holiness was and what it would require to be in relationship with him. In this way, the law functioned as a mirror showing Israel their sinful condition and likewise for us today in that we cannot fulfill it. It was intended to guide us as a way of living, though salvation is not acquired through it, but through following its commands, we will please and glorify our Creator. So where do you fall foul? Do you want to do away with it all together? Do you want to relax it and make it easier to, to obey? Or do you want to be an authority over it? They are all wrong ways to view the Scriptures. Because we're still left with this problem. God still knows and cares about your heart. And his righteousness remains, which means we still need a greater righteousness. Are you guilty of trying to find it these ways? You see, as the mirror of scripture exposes our sins and that we don't measure up, that it contradicts ourselves, we want to change and justify and make allowances, appease culture, family, friends, we actually end up denying the authority of God and distorting it altogether. We can emphasize certain parts of God's word, downplay others, but Jesus doesn't give us that permission. God's holiness is revealed and our lack of it is exposed. So what are you going to do with the reality? Are you going to change to try and obtain this righteousness yourself? Jesus today calls you to stop it. Why? Because God cares and knows your heart. You must deal with what is exposed by his word. Don't suppress it or oppress it. I just want to commend you today that were you falling foul of this? You see, what we will do is we will try to keep everything at external length and deal with it externally rather than dealing with our hearts. You see, we cannot hide our inner being because in doing so, we cannot be that perfect, that complete, that whole, that blessed state that we've looked at over these last few weeks. The pain, the regret, the guilt, the shame that you have. Yes, it may be easier to suppress than deal with, but you shouldn't do that because doing that keeps God at a distance and he loves you and knows and cares for your heart and he wants to deal with it, make you new in it. Don't avoid the challenge of this by serving or or by busyness and trying to escape by hiding from these truths and perform externally and look like you have it all together when really inside we know that you're broken. So many of us can learn about God and learn theology and memorize the Bible and and be be a hero and a savior to everybody when there's need around us. But really what we're doing is just hiding the reality that we need Jesus. And aren't you just weary by all that? Tired of performing, tired of doing lots of externally righteous good things and great big theological words and moral uh, laws that you're keeping. When the reality is if you're trusting in your own external righteousness for salvation, you have no assurance. And this is what Romans 3, 19 to 20 was saying. Now we, it says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. Jesus wants you to stop. 
to know that the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. So stop. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Allow God's word to expose your sin, your need and your righteousness that you need. This is the bad news. God sees and cares about your heart. We cannot do anything. We cannot keep performing and pretending without paying attention to what is going on in the inside because he sees your inner being. He sees your heart and he wants to deal with it. So be honest today with the brokenness inside of you. See your anger, your lust, your brokenness and come to him. Thirdly, we need a greater righteousness outside of ourselves you see that that first option was merely one where we tried to obtain a righteousness ourselves but my but what we see now is that we need to have a greater righteousness outside of ourselves you see when jesus talks about our righteousness exceeding in verse 20 he's not talking about it in at, in degree and that greater that we must do more he's talking about a different kind of righteousness we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven with with our degree of righteousness because that's that we can't obtain that perfection We've already fallen short. We need a greater righteousness, a different kind of righteousness. And that the purpose of the law was to reveal who God is and who we are. What Jesus is doing here is continuing and upholding and bringing us to the end of our vain attempts of trying to obtain God's favor in our works and our actions. And he's trying to bring us to the end of ourselves where we will see and receive a greater righteousness. It's a righteousness that begins in the heart and from that heart which is renewed we will therefore reflect him in our actions. Just think again about those the the, the, the rest of chapter 5 which we're going to look at in the coming weeks but just those ones I said earlier. It's a bit like Jesus saying well done you didn't murder anybody this week congratulations but on your inside you're still filled with anger and hate. It's like Jesus saying well well done you didn't commit adultery this week congratulations but on the inside you're still filled with lust. It's like, well done, congratulations, you loved your family and friends who are easy to love this week, but you hate your enemies. You see, Jesus is not merely after our external deeds. He doesn't really just want us to do actions and things for him. He wants our heart. He wants to utterly transform, renew and reform your heart so that you would walk in his ways. Not walk in his ways and deny your inner being. He's concerned about the whole being of us. You see, it's not enough to merely focus on external righteousness. Your external righteousness needs to match your internal heart. And that is the greater righteousness that Jesus is speaking about. You see, the law was to drive us in our need to Jesus. And I quote Martin Luther on this. He says, the law must be laid upon those that are to be justified. That is made right with God. That's what justified means. That they may be shut up in the prison thereof until the righteousness of faith comes. That when they are cast down and humbled by the law, they should fly to Christ. The law humbles them, not to their destruction, but to their salvation. For God woundeth that he may heal again. He killeth that he may, he may quicken again. How beautiful is that? The law was not meant for our destruction. The law was meant to drive us to Christ, to the gospel. That was his experience. He saw himself falling short of the righteousness of God and the law drove him to his depths of despair and to his urgent need of grace. And when he believed that, he received mercy and grace and righteousness, a greater righteousness and became one of the most influential men in the history of the church. And there's a parallel with him and another, uh, another old dead guy uh, that we love reading about, John Wesley, who, who offered many hymns and was a great preacher. And he likewise had a similar experience. He saw the requirements of God and tried to meet them, but he failed. But coming to the end of himself, he too believed and lived this incredible, greater righteousness life where he was spiritually broken and humbled by the law, but Christ redeemed him, restored him and gave him a greater righteousness. These men, ourselves today, Jesus himself as he teaches us, we need to be people of the whole revealed words. We need the law to expose our need and brokenness, to drive us to the gospel. And in the gospel, we receive the greater righteousness. But we need to be both people of the Old Testament and New Testament because to be one or the other is to be a one-legged believer, essentially. We need to spend time in God's word to be exposed of our sin, so we're driven to our need. And in our need, we find a great righteousness 
You see, it's not enough to merely focus on external righteousness. Your external righteousness needs to match your internal heart. And the problem is Jesus is here highlighting the problem that our human tendency is to keep things external rather than looking on the inside. Keep everything about doing and look good on the outside, but don't worry about the inside. No, Jesus is concerned about that inner place. Don't be content with external righteousness. Pay attention to what is going on in there. Because when you do, you come to see that God has always been about utterly transforming and renewing and reforming his people. In Ezekiel 36, you will have seen in the law and the prophets that he always promised to do this work. How comforting to read. In Ezekiel 36, he says this in verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God was always about renewing and reforming and restoring our hearts by giving us a new heart. A new heart of righteousness, not about calling us to mere external deeds of righteousness and with that spirit he puts in our heart he will then cause that spirit to make us walk in his statues and his ways again jeremiah 31 one of the prophets of old says exactly the same thing in verses 33 to 34 it says this for this is the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days declares the lord i will put my law within them can it be any more clear he will put his law in us not abolish it and i will write it on their hearts And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So what Jesus is saying in a sermon on the mount in verses 17 to 19, he's saying that he is the fulfillment of those promises. God never intended you to be able to achieve righteousness, to be perfect, to enter the kingdom of heaven. He always intended to expose your need and send his own son. That's why Jesus says in verse 17, I've not come to abolish the law. That's why he says in verse 18, none of it's going away until all is accomplished. Verse 19, I've not come to relax any of it, but uphold it and teach it and you're to do likewise you see what's this teaching us jesus is the greater righteousness that's what we're to see that's what is to be exposed and this is what romans 3 is teaching us verses 21 to 26 it says this but now the righteousness of god has been manifested apart from the law that means jesus Although the law and prophets bear witness to it, it was always about Jesus and his righteousness. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We have all fallen short. We are all guilty. There's no distinction. But God has made his righteousness manifest through his son. And through his son can we be made right. Why? Verse 25. God puts him forward as a propitiation. That means he absorbs the wrath that we deserve for our sin. By his blood. And what are we to do? Receive it by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus comes and because of our sin he takes our place, our punishment, what we deserve. Even though he was perfect, he was the only righteous one. He is the greater righteousness but as he absorbs the wrath he is now able to be just and the justifier of those who have faith in God. This is what it goes on to say chapter 4 verse 5 and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness what does that mean remember righteousness means being right with god and justified means made right with god through jesus death he has made us right with god and now clothes us with his righteousness so we are right with god 
This was always the intention of God, promised in Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31. The whole Old Testament law was pointing to the greater righteousness and Jesus comes and fulfills it in our place, which is exactly what Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 3. This was always the intention in verse 10 to verse 14. It says this, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. That was us, all of us. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That's us. None of us can do that. We cannot attain it. Verse 11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. See the change? It's by faith, not by our works we are saved. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So as we now believe in faith and are justified and made right with God, we now therefore live by faith, obeying the law. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Through Christ who became the curse for us, even though we were cursed, we can now receive the righteousness, the greater righteousness of Jesus through the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is the good news, folk. folks. God, our creator and father, knows us better than we know us. And he loves us. He knows and cares about your heart so much. He sends his son to become the curse for us, to receive the judgment and wrath that we deserve so that we now by faith can receive his righteousness. We are robed in his righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we through faith can now have his righteousness. We receive this righteousness, this greater righteousness by faith. So embrace the righteousness of Jesus. Don't undo any of what he has done or said, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Don't deny any of it because if you deny it, Galatians 1, 6 says that, that we have no gospel at all. He in your place takes your good and bad deeds. And in the great exchange, takes our sin, shame and guilt and gives us his righteousness. This is how you receive the greater righteousness and we receive it by faith. And if you possess it by faith of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isn't that what we long for? Then let's enjoy it, bask in it and embrace it. Blessed are you when you come to your spiritual bankruptcy and see that you have nothing but need because in that moment you find the greater righteousness of Jesus who meets your need and gives you his Holy Spirit so you can know him. Oh, we have a greater righteousness in Jesus. Embrace it. The law drives us to the gospel in our need and in our need we receive the righteousness of Christ. And fourthly and very quickly and lastly, because we have this greater righteousness, we are now free to obey the law. Because God knows and cares for our hearts, he wants us to walk in his ways. What are those ways? It's everything previously in chapter five of, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's everything after that we're now gonna look at in the next few weeks. Those are the ways we are to walk in, but we can only walk in them not as a way to achieve righteousness, but because we have received the righteousness, we walk in his ways. Because of Jesus, we're free from the condemnation of the law and are now by the Spirit empowered and enabled and free to obey his ways. We are not a law to ourselves that because grace abounds, we therefore keep sinning. By no means. Because God knows and cares about our hearts, we are to walk in his righteousness. We obey out of the beauty of Jesus, not of duty to Jesus. And this is exactly what Romans Free says, I know I'm flip or sorry, Romans. Yeah, I know I'm flipping around, but I will write all these down for you so you can come back to them in our gospel communities this week and reflect on the magnitude of what is going on here. This is a core theme of the Bible and the salvation and the kingdom of God. In Romans 8, it says this: There is now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. What good news for us this morning, folks? You're not under the condemnation of God if you're in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. We are free from the curse of the law. In Christ Jesus, from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. We couldn't do it. But by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. 
We now walk by the Spirit who writes on our hearts what is good and right and pleasing to God. He leads us into it. He empowers, He enables us to carry it out and convicts us when we go wrong, but brings us back in the comfort of the gospel to remind us that Christ has done it already. This is why no one enters the kingdom of heaven without this greater righteousness, because you need to be born again. And those who have entered the kingdom of heaven by this righteousness, therefore, out of beauty and delight and joy in Jesus, walk in his ways. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary in a Sermon on the Mount, reminds us that to say that we are under a grace, therefore we don't need to do anything with the law or the Old Testament and can forget it, is not teaching the scriptures. He goes on to say that yes, we are not under the law in the sense of condemnation as we read, but we are meant to live it and we are even to go beyond it, which is what makes sense of Jesus in the next few weeks will say, yeah, well done, you didn't murder, but you still have hate. And you know what? Because of the presence of hate in you, I want to utterly eradicate your heart of that so you will know pure delight and joy in me. That's what it means to be pure in heart, single-mindedly devoted to him. Now we understand the greater righteousness and how we receive it through the work of Jesus. We therefore now wrestle with what it means to put that greater righteousness into action in the everyday of our hearts. We obey out of beauty to Jesus, not out of a duty, because we love what God loves. To fulfill the law is to do the works of God with pleasure and love. Not just doing them, It's a doing them of pleasure and love because you want to and you love God because he has loved you so immensely, richly, deeply in Jesus. Is obeying the commands of God a pleasure and love for you? If you've never experienced that, perhaps you haven't received the Spirit, perhaps you're not a believer. And now we call you, now you know what to do. Repent of your self-righteousness, which are filthy rags in the eyes of God and receive humbly with hands open the righteousness of Jesus who's done it all for you. And if you are a believer and you're finding it hard to experience that pleasure and joy, what must you do? Stop trying in your own strength and walk it out in submission to Jesus in the power and the enabling work of the Holy Spirit who leads us in the truth and enables us to obey him. And yes, you may be experiencing conviction in light of this, but that's a good thing because he drives you deeper into the comfort of Jesus' arms. The law drives us to the gospel in our need and the gospel frees us to obey the law in our lives. You see, to the command and imperative of verse 20 that you need a greater righteousness comes the balm of verse 17 that says, I have fulfilled it. To, to the distress of verse 20 that says, I can't do this, comes the ease of verse 17 that says, I have fulfilled it. To, to, the, to the anxiety of our inability of verse 20 of achieving this greater righteousness, Jesus comes with his ability and says, I have fulfilled it. To our emptiness and need of verse 20, Jesus comes with his fullness and says, I have fulfilled it. He is sufficient. So he says, I have fulfilled it. So he says he will accomplish it. So therefore don't relax any of it, but teach it loudly, boldly and clearly that Christ has done it and thereby enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you that in exposing our need, exposing our lack of righteousness, you do not seek our destruction, rather you seek our salvation. And you drive us to the good news of the gospel that a crisis righteousness is sufficient, that he has done it all in our place. Where we are lacking, he meets our need. Where we are empty, he is full. Thank you, Jesus, that on the cross you took the wrath that we deserve. Thank you for your perfect life, your perfect righteous life that that we could never live. Thank you for doing it in our place and thank you in our place taking the punishment we deserve. But we praise you that you rose again three days later, conquering death, freeing us from the curse of the law, freeing us from sin and death. And thereby now in you, having received your righteousness, You now indwell us through your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I I, I plead with you that you would help us, whether that be through conviction or comfort right now, to lead us to walk in these greater ways of the kingdom of heaven. And thereby, we will truly be salt and light. Holy Spirit, drive us to spiritual bankruptcy. Remind us afresh and comfort us with the need that we have with this sufficiency and the fullness of Christ that meets our need. Thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for reminding us of these truths. And I pray that you would work them deeply into our hearts and our minds in these coming weeks 
as we look at the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And I ask this in your gracious, precious name. Amen. Isn't it incredible that Jesus perfectly fulfills the law that we just could not ever imagine being able to live up to? And not only that, he then died a perfect death because he was the perfect sacrifice. And he took that sin and that shame and that guilt that we carry onto himself so that we may live in freedom without that burden. So this, these, this next song we're just going to use as a response time. Um, so as we're singing it, just remember that what Jesus has done, who he is, and let's just give him praise this morning that is, that is due his name. I hear the Saviour say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. Can change the leper's loss and man.
What an incredible reminder, incredible encouraging words, yet not I, but Christ in me, that we need to be totally dependent on our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Well, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. It's been a real honour and privilege that you've been able to join us and sing with us and praise our King and Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Well, I just want to hope that you've been encouraged and challenged as you've heard God's word this morning. In a moment, we're going to chat about how we've been encouraged and how we've been challenged on Zoom groups in our gospel communities. I want to encourage you to take part in that. Uh, and it'll be a place in which you can pray for each other also. If you're new uh, and you're not part of a gospel community and you want to find out more about us as churches or you want to find out more about Christianity, you can also join a Zoom group immediately after this service and that'll be a great space in which you can ask your questions and find out more. Maybe you're unable to do that right now, uh, but you do want to find out more about us as churches. You can click on the link, the churchconnect.info link, and you can find out more about us as churches opportunity to ask questions there and also share your details as well so we want to encourage you to do that well in a moment i'm going to pray to conclude i want to pray that we this week live out in light of all that we have heard um, god speak to us and encourage us uh, so let's pray now father god we just thank you for your goodness and your grace we thank you that jesus came not to get rid of the law but to fulfill the law we thank you that he was the only one able to do that. That he lived this perfect life in every way. Father, as we see our need for Jesus, as we see that we need your grace and your goodness, Father, I pray that you would help us, maybe for the first time this morning, for those who don't know you, to come and put their trust in you. And for those of us who, who are followers of Jesus, for those who are Christians, Father, I pray that you would be at work in our hearts. You would stir our affections and our love for you and your word and for one another as we live out our lives for your glory and for your praise. And we pray for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.